and about teaching, learning that takes place in the classroom, as well as the quality of teacher that might be placed in those classrooms. So I think we need to be very uh, cognizant of those assumptions as to how they might really play a, a role in terms of you know, uh, how we see this teaching learning. So I think that's very important uh, for us to question. Uh, 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 because I truly believe that children have this wonderful ability, capacity, to learn multiple languages. And then, of course, uh, uh, you know, the language we are talking about this mo in, you know, in, in this particular session is that uh, Tibetan language is seen as a facilitative language. It is the one that's going to facilitate them to learn the concepts. And I truly believe that a concept learned in Tibetan language is exactly the same as a concept learned in English. And then, you know, keep in mind, they are also being provided English language instruction. Th that English language is not being ignored at all. Because we are accurately aware of the fact that this symbolic dominance, dominance of English language is very perversive. Children tend to you know, uh, really uh, show this interest to learn English language, no matter what we might do in the classroom. So this particular emphasis on Tibetan language is to really challenge that symbolic dominance. So that these Tibetan children will continue to acquire Tibetan language proficiency. And then also uh, what we have said this morning is that our intent is to really develop, to produce, highly proficient bilingual individuals. And once we have produced highly proficient bilingual individuals, then, you know, content is almost, you know, you could, it is called CUP, Common Underlying Proficiency. That means you are actually engaged in what is called seamless learning process. And then, of course, uh, you know, uh, after 12th grade, they might go to Indian University, whatever it is. Uh, and what I want to share with you is, just from my own personal experience, when I went to the United States, I was really very good in Tibetan language. And when I would sit in the class, you know, listening to my professors, I had to struggle to understand what they were telling me in Tibetan language first. Tibetan language came to my rescue. I had to understand the concept in Tibetan language first, and then something strange will take place in my head. And then I would, you know, slowly kind of like try to understand that concept in English. Now, after having taught so many years in America, I have crossed the threshold. So these days, I don't have that problem. I could uh, understand in Tibetan language, as well as in English language. Uh, so, which means, you know, I cross the threshold. And another thing I want to bring to attention is, in my campus, we have a lot of Chinese faculty. They teach math, they teach physics, without any English language proficiency. And I would always ask my, you know, uh, American uh, students, I mean, how are you learning math, and, uh, you know, in this class? But the fact of the matter is that this Chinese faculty is very good in math, in Chinese language. And he's able to explain really properly. And then these actually students pay greater attention, you know, because they don't know what he might say. Uh, so uh, I, I think we should not overly worry, really, as to you know, what might happen to the occupation of our Tibetan children. Uh, really, we should not worry. We should be really worried whether the Tibetan children will be able to sustain, preserve Tibetan language. And you know, as uh, Arvind Ji has said, Arvind Ji has said, Tibetan language has this political interpretation connotation. We should not forget that aspect. I mean, really, if you undermine that aspect, we would have done a disservice to the Tibetan nation. I think we would. We don't want to fall into that category. We shouldn't be seen as this generation that has really ignored the Tibetan language. So I hope you will keep that in mind. And then, of course, one thing I heard very consistently is that the language is like a vessel, a very delicate vessel that holds all this wonderful content. And not only that, it also key to open the doors to all this wonderful content. And then, you know, Professor Kumaji has really provided a lot of ideas for us in terms of how we can really, you know, help our children acquire 
proficiencies in all languages, really paying attention to those beginning stages, you know. And so, I mean, really, if we pay attention to those suggestions and ideas, we should not be worried. Our children will end up being bilingual, trilingual, and whatnot. And then the world is actually open, for, open more for bilinguals, uh, you know, trilinguals. And if you are a scientist in Tibetan language, I am 100% positive you will be validated. If you're a very good scientist, language is not that important. I mean, look at the you know, Japanese, you know, or the Chinese. Uh, so, uh, you know, that is something, you know, I thought I must really uh, uh, share with you, uh, you know, uh, as a bad part of my chair's remark, concluding. And uh, I think that's where I would like to end. And I'm really, uh, I want to thank you for allowing me to be the chair. And I really enjoyed this <laughs> process. Thank you.